Good evening. Welcome to Ethics and Governance. We're up to webinar eight. My name's Courtney. Uh, I'm the sort of the original, well, one of the original authors of module one and a reviewing author for some of the other modules as well. Module four is probably my favourite module and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And the reason why module four is so good is it looks at things like anti-competitive conduct and all the things that companies can do to sneak, to steal, to make profits without doing it properly, genuinely and fairly. So uh, quite a lot of new people on board this semester. Welcome to you and I hope you find tonight useful and encouraging. One of the key things here is we're in module four, it's worth a quarter of your exam and it builds on module three. That's 50% of your study. If you don't know these two modules inside out, you are going to struggle to pass this semester. Um, all up, by the end of tonight, we would have covered 85% of the study guide. So you're pretty much at the end. And the key thing here, our first practice exam is on Friday. Well, you don't have to do it on Friday. That's when it's avail available. <laughs> I'm glad it's your favourite as well and good evening. So Friday is the first day. You'll, you'll, we'll show you the exam scheduling. So some of you tried to schedule an exam a little bit early, but we only open them up this Friday and that's sort of just two weeks out from when the exam period starts. Then the second practice exam will be available the following weekend. Uh, don't panic about how to access them or where it's all from. We'll send you emails, lots of information, and I will talk through that later on tonight. So this week we finished module four. Next week we crash through module five. We have two weeks on it because it's such a long and complicated topic. Only worth 15%, but it is worth spending a bit of time there. So practice exams. The first thing to note, the first day you can do them is this Friday. And if your exam is on Saturday the 14th of October, I strongly recommend you doing it Friday or Saturday or Sunday. Do it this weekend and start getting your feedback. Now, lots of people ask me, is it on all of the modules? Yes, modules one to five. But if you haven't read module five and you need to get on, it doesn't matter. It's just like a CPA exam. You've got to turn up on the scheduled day, get the job done. If you miss out on a few marks, that's tough luck. Just schedule your exam sit your exam, your practice exam. Don't try and wait till you've mastered all the material. You will run out of time for sure. So to get access, the first thing you have to do is upload your CPA uh, enrollment. If you haven't done that, you'll still get access to it in a practice exam, but you won't get it marked, uh, the written section marked by me. You will just get the suggested answers presented. Then uh, schedule your practice exam, and you need to do this uh, by 28. To get access as well, you need to complete all of the modules one, two, three, and four. You don't have to do module five because um, we haven't even got to module five yet, but you should have done modules units one to four. We find that people who skip these units and then do the practice exam do very poorly and it's a wasted experience. So we're pretty um, good at enforcing that because our distinction and high distinction rates are growing nearly 25% and our fail rates dropped to around 11%. So we're really happy. So make your booking, uh, they, the first exam can be done from Friday onwards. And why do we have this thing called the last day? Well, the last day is when you can sit it and still receive written feedback from me in time for your final exam. It takes me four business days to do the marking. So keep that in mind. All right, week eight. I hope you enjoyed the email. I hope you've uh, seen uh, these appear in your accounts and I hope you've ignored them because people always get caught by these kind of scams. So the question is, why do people send these emails and why do people respond to them? And it's, the answer is we love a good deal. Humans are wired to take advantage of great deals and it's so easy to manipulate people. And the, the key test here is if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. If someone wants to give you a great deal for nothing, you have to be very cautious because they can't always be trusted. So. In week eight, the aim is finish module four. You should be watching all the short videos in module four, reading it, it's very long. And today we have two legal questions to work on using the IRAC method, power transformers and Mitsubishi Electric. Each week I show you how we map to the subject objectives and what a good feeling to see that by week eight, we've nearly finished them all. This is where we're up to. And this is captured in module three and module four. And this is the foundation of what you'll be examining. So module four, last week we looked at what is success because at the end of module three, we looked at failure, corporate governance failure. How do we fix that? How do we turn it into success? Then what we've got is operations and we have some examples there. 
And we started on the legal system, we looked at abuse of market power, and we started to touch on cartel conduct. So I'm going to, the rest of tonight is going to focus on these components of module four. Lots of legal requirements here, which is technical. It's actually really easy to get exam answers right, because if you know the law, you'll get this right. And if you don't know it, you'll get it pretty much wrong. So it, it's, it's a good feeling to know you can get these right. So these are the objectives. And uh, for those of you who've come along a few times, I always ask this question. What's the percentage of module four in terms of your exam weighting? Can you remember this from the timetable slide? Yeah, 25%. People are on the, on the ball. That is just fantastic and that's great. You are going to get one quarter of your whole CPA exam on this. And that's why I say it's worth it. It's, it's a quarter of the semester. You should be putting in at least 100 hours. So 25 hours should be going into module four. And how is it going to work? You are going to get lots of questions on understanding law because there's so much law. There's abuse of market power. There's cartel conduct. There's insider trading. There's misleading markets. So you need to know lots of law. You're going to get lots of questions there. We look at key components of diversity and remuneration, structuring the board, the two strikes rule. How do we deal with people getting paid too much? We look at the key operational responsibilities. So you are going to get, so 25%, a quarter of your exam, about 21 or 22 marks allocated here. So these could be, you know, that could be 10 marks worth of written answer. There could be 15 marks of MCQs. We don't know the exact mix, but you are going to get plenty of questions in this area. So turn these six objectives into a practice exam for yourself and see if you know all of these areas very well. Last week, we looked at gender diversity and just a few key stats. So women have now 26% or a quarter of new appointments to ASX boards. And have a look at what it was in 2008, 2009, 8%, 5%. So we have seen a huge improvement in gender diversity, but it's still quite a bit behind what we would call equality, but slowly improving. And these were the questions that were asked last week. So a quick summary, there's still 11 companies in the top 200 listed on the ASX with no women. But that's a huge improvement from a few years ago when it was actually 31. So there's been a, a huge improvement. It was 15%, now 5%. It links to the ASX principle uh, one and recommendation 1.5. And uh, are these numbers examinable in the exam? No, because what I did was by creating this question, I wanted to show you that it's not just theory in the study guide. This is really happening right now and being reported on on a monthly basis. But you can be given case facts. So this question here could be examinable. What's the most relevant principle and recommendation? And is it in breach? So that's how it would be structured. Then last week I talked about where does module four fit? So the start of the CPA study guide starts off with what is a profession and what is ethics. So professionals have to be ethical. So what does this mean? And how do I deal with the ethical dilemmas that I face? Then we move into phase two, governance. Because we have poor ethics, we have to have rules governing how we direct and control our organizations. But because directors are self-interested, because they are egoists, they often misbehave. So we have to have laws and duties in place to stop them doing things like excessive remuneration, acting with a conflict of interest, cheating and, and breaking the rules. But even with all this governance, we still have failures. So we have our ASX principles, we have our FRC code, and we have this movement towards things like diversity and controlling remuneration. Now, businesses want to win, and when they win, they get profits, and the, the leaders, the managers, they get huge bonuses. So of course, they are going to be tempted into, I use the word sneaky behavior, dishonest behavior, unprofessional behavior, because it's easier to collude with your competitors than to work hard sell things for a lower price, strive, and always be fighting uphill. And so we have anti-competitive conduct, things like price fixing or abusing market power. Not only that, people take advantage of their customers. They rip them off. They promise something and then they don't deliver it. They promise all of these great features, but it really is useless. They promise a certain level of quality, but the thing doesn't work. So we have to have rules and protections in this case to make sure that it's working fairly. Uh, 
if you have uh, audio visual issues and things like that, if you wouldn't mind using the uh, email for here, and then Angus can check your back end because uh, if my connection's strong, then uh, audio and visual. So audio is my voice. But if you could use the inquiries email, then Angus can check your connection and test that um, rather than in the chat box. Thanks. So here are the specific objectives again. And last week we looked at objective one and objective four at the start. Specifically, governance failures, the end of module three. Complex instruments, remuneration, willful blindness, where people pretended they didn't actually know what was going on. So we looked at success and the structuring the board to add value, making sure there's proper diversity and avoiding excessive remuneration. So things like the two strikes rule, where you have to prevent, um, if, if people are trying to pay themselves too much, you can try and remove them. There's automatic disqualifications for certain directors who've breached laws and rules that are severe enough or acted dishonestly. So the way we structure our board, whether we stagger it or destagger it, or using things like uh, two strikes rule. Then we looked at operations, and that's objective two. And one of the key problems here was that 7-Eleven example where people were being paid only half of the amount they were actually owed. So that was very unethical. It took advantage of their poor situation where they were um, breaching visa requirements. So they were saying, if you don't do this, we will deport you. And then OHS, the stress and pressure related to that. And the owners of the franchises were in, in serious financial trouble as well, because if they didn't cheat on payroll, they couldn't make enough money to pay all their bills. So we have a fair pay situation and strict and unfair working conditions. So as accountants, as people working in professional industry, we knew about these things, but the accountants in this business said nothing about all of these operational issues. But if we want to do ethics and governance, we have to be able to prevent this from happening and speak up when we see it taking place. So then audit responsibilities, laws and regulations, and this is where we got up to last week. So the key here with the, the legal system, and uh, here's the list of laws that I mentioned. So all of these have, have law involved, abuse of market power, M&A, cartel conduct, exclusive dealing, resale price maintenance, misleading conduct, uh, insider trading market manipulation. So you can get law questions in any of these areas. When we prove our, our cases, we have to, in one case for civil, and this is where we're trying to get fixing the problem. So if, if I've been harmed, I want to be compensated for that. I want damages. I want compensation. I want uh, redress. And in this case, you've got to prove it more likely than less likely. So on a balance of probabilities, a greater chance than, than less that this took place. But with criminal, the penalties are much more severe. They're focused on punishment. They can have jail terms, you know, prison sentences serious fines and therefore the, the burden of proof is much higher and needs to be beyond reasonable doubt. So and there's short videos on each of these topics that I've mentioned, things like the two strikes rule and civil and criminal penalties. So the different types of anti-competitive conduct in the study guide, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the recording option. So you'll have to be more specific. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've got abuse of market power, cartels, exclusive dealing, and RPM, resale price maintenance. Uh, could you, if you could email inquiries mailbox, uh, or I'll help you at the end of the, the webinar, but during the webinar. So answering the legal question, this was the task. So, so quick question to you. If, when you read through the preparation work, I gave you two areas to investigate. Um, what we can do is, did you log into the main course and do these two questions? One was on the electrical transformers and one was on Mitsubishi. So how many people were able to use the IRAC section to, um, to answer these two questions? If you just use the chat box, yes or no? Excellent. 
I haven't got to it yet, that's okay. The Sometimes people say, well, how do I get ready for this exam? And the answer is practice. It's not enough to read a question and think about the answer. Actually write out the answer. That is the best practice uh, that I can encourage for you to do. So abuse of market power. And we looked at this briefly last week. But So with Iraq, the issue is the key concept. So here, has there been an abuse of market power? Well, to figure this out, what we do is we look at Section 46 of the Competition and Consumer Act. And we say, is there a corporation, is there a business with substantial degree of power and have they taken advantage of that? So you see, we, we can phrase it question after question. Is there a corporation? Do they have a substantial degree of power? Now, who determines that? Um, all right, this is, I'm happy to talk about the recording option at the end of the webinar. So if you could just hold off on posting, that would be really helpful. Thank you. We don't have a recording option on this webinar. We record it and host it elsewhere. So, What we've got is establish a degree of market power. The case facts will tell you this. Have you taken advantage of that market power to eliminate someone or prevent them from competing? If that has occurred, then you have a breach of market power. So you list the issue, then the law, then you talk through the case facts, and then you made a conclusion in that situation. So task for you, and question 4.6. Quick and easy one. I'm seeing lots of Ds, which is great. And that is correct. So what we've got, this isn't cartel conduct. This is and this is, but it's not relevant to this case. So slightly tougher question now, and I've, I've modified it. See how you go now. So now we have two organisations working together, setting a price and selling it to the same company. All right, so we're seeing a slight variation in answer. So I, I lifted the, the difficulty here, which is great. And what we've got is cartel behaviour, which is the broad definition, and price fixing, which is the specific type. Now, it can. This is the reason I ask this question is, you know, I've marked a, a couple of years worth of exams, about 10 years or 20 semesters, and students often confuse price fixing with resale price maintenance. So I want to make that very clear. Price fixing is when two competitors get together. And if you have a look, Shark and Bruce are competitors and they're setting a price. Resale price maintenance is when an organisation sets a minimum price for the company it sells to, who then retails the goods. So that is vertical, whereas price fixing is what we call horizontal between competitors. Uh, so with cartel behaviour versus price fixing, they are the same thing. And I'll talk about these more in a minute. But if you can think of a Venn diagram, if you remember your Venn diagram to mathematics, right. So cartel behaviour is the big circle. So there's four main types of cartel behaviour, of which one is here. One is called price fixing. So they are not different. Cartel behaviour is anything between competitors to take advantage and eliminate competition, of which one technique is price fixing. So I hope that makes a bit more sense. And I'm going to talk through these in just a moment. So first of all, with cartel conduct, uh, the most famous one is OPEC. And these are the countries that get together and they control the output of oil to try and push the price up. So they collude together as competitors and say, if we all work together and limit the supply of oil, we can get a higher result. So then we have output restrictions. 
So the output restrictions is this idea of what OPEC do, and there's a short video on cartel conduct that helps explain that. And then what we've got is a mini quiz. So these are short, easy questions, just to make sure you understand this concept in a lot more detail. So then another type of cartel conduct is called dividing a market. Uh, no, so cartel conduct is not abuse of the market. Abuse of the market is when one, let's, if, let me just go back to the law for abuse of the market. If we have a look here, abuse of the market is when one corporation uses that power to damage a competitor. Cartel conduct is when competitors work together. So the competitors here are working together to take advantage and get higher prices or whatever from the consumer. That's different. So abuse of market power is separate to cartel conduct. So you can divide a market. So one way of doing this, and I used to, I once worked, uh, I used to buy IT equipment in an organisation I was in, and one of the suppliers got very angry because they said, oh, you can't buy from that other competitor. We have divided the market in Melbourne. They literally drew a line down the centre of Melbourne and said everything on the east side is yours and the west side is mine. That's totally uh, prohibited and not allowed to be done. So competitors are not allowed to carve up the market. You have to compete. Otherwise, the customer misses out. The customer is forced to pay a much higher price. Uh, I haven't got too exclusive dealing yet, so if you just give me a minute on that. So uh, give me a minute to get to the end of cartel conduct, and then I'll, I'll stop and answer your questions. All right, so the next item we've got is bid rigging. So bid rigging is a situation. I'm not sure what just happened with my screen there. All right, so bid rigging is when people, competitors, all compete for the same tender, but they cheat. So imagine instead of when you put your prices in for a tender, your aim is to, to try and win that job. But if you collude with your competitors, what you do is you all agree to put the price up really high. So that's three worth of tenders. And then someone else goes in with a low tender. And therefore, this one is pretty much guaranteed to win the work. Now, you do that for tender one. So this company will win tender number one. But then you change the story. So then this company here will win tender number two. And then so on. We share the tenders around. So everyone gets a nice high price rather than competing too vigorously. And this, the example in your study guide is of the Canberra construction industry where people bid for construction work, but they were actually colluding together to do that. Uh, so why would you do bid rigging? The, the answer here is you wouldn't unless, let's say they're going to be four tenders in the year. So what you would do is you'd make sure one of you wins tender one, then tender two, then someone else will win tender three, and then someone else wins tender four. So you all win a tender at a much higher price than you otherwise would have done. So I hope that makes sense for you. And then the fourth type is price fixing. And this one is normally a little bit easier. Uh, in a sense, it is, it's sharing the market, but it's not exactly the same because with dividing a market, they bid rigging is when you keep competing in the same market. For example, Canberra, which is in the Australian Capital Territory, dividing a market is where you say, I'm not even going to go for the tenders that are in your state. So I won't go for anything in New South Wales and you don't go for anything in Victoria. So it's a bit like bid rigging, but it's, it's not even participating in the bid, for example. Finally, we have price fixing, which is where competitors get together to fix a price, set a price, rather than making sure it's done. So this was question number one, and I'll give you a moment, if you haven't looked at this in detail, take a minute to look at it. And my encouragement, get a pen and paper out and start quickly. You should be able to answer this within five lines on a piece of paper. And while you do that, I'll have a look at some of the outstanding chat box questions. Uh, so is cartel conduct prohibited under the consumer law? Yes, so uh, that's, it's, it's in what used to be called the Trade Practices Act but, and then Australian consumer law. So that's, that's all prohibited there. The difference between exclusive dealing and market abuse. So exclusive dealing is when you refuse to interact with a particular customer 
who wants to buy from you to keep your prices higher. So that's uh, a market abuse is when you are destroying your competitors. So exclusive dealing is about protecting your price of your product, but market abuse is, is abusing your competitor. What was the example given by your horizontal versus vertical for price fixing retail? So with horizontal, I'll, I'll show you the next, in, in just a minute, horizontal means between competitors, because if we draw a value chain from top to bottom, I'll, I'll go to here, a value chain goes down like this. So we have the raw materials, then the manufacturing, then the wholesaler, then the retailer, then the customer. So at each step in the value chain, you have competitors. So if you work with your competitors, that is horizontal activity. But if you work with people further down the chain, it's called vertical. So that's, that's the description there. Cool, so I think I've answered all of those. How substantial power is determined under abuse of market power? So, I mean, look, the, the law courts will fight about this for weeks and months. It's actually very complicated, but in an exam question, you will be given enough information to show that there is substantial power in a particular situation. All right, so looking at the power transformers, let's see if we can start answering this question using IRAC. So the first question we ask, so the issue is, has there been cartel conduct? That's the issue. And what does it link to? So the first question or test of establishing cartel conduct is, is there an arrangement? Is there an arrangement, agreement or understanding? Is there, normally there's not a written contract in place because when people break the law, they try not to put it in writing. But we ask, is there an arrangement? And the picture I want you to have is this one. It's called, is there a nexus or a meeting of the minds? Do the two competitors look at each other and know that they want to uh, collude together? Is there a meeting of the minds? This can be done um, via text message, by chatting, by an informal meeting, all of these ways. It doesn't have to be a written contract. So we would say that, that this definitely is in place in this in this story. The next question is, is it between competitors? So that's why I have this picture here. This is horizontal and that's different because sometimes prices are set between you and your retailer. If you're a wholesaler and the retailer, that's vertical. That's not the same as cartel conduct horizontal between competitors. And the third question, is the conduct prohibited or will it hurt competition? And so we come back to the case facts and uh, we have the issue, has cartel conduct occurred? And the relevant law says that cartel conduct such as price fixing, dividing the market, bid rigging is prohibited because it's anti-competitive. It substantially lessens competition because these people aren't competing fairly. They're getting more money than they otherwise would. So let's apply this to the case facts. There have been secret meetings. They were held and the contract outcomes were manipulated. Tenders were abused, like uh, bid rigging, setting of prices, dividing up the market. Now, this, this isn't a full answer. You would have to then go in and, and answer the three questions. Was there an arrangement, an agreement, an understanding? Yes. Was it between competitors? Yes. So test number one, yes. Two. Test number two, was it between competitors? Yes. Had it the purpose of substantially lessening competition or was it prohibited? Yes. And therefore, we have real problems in place. And Simone's posted that. Listed the key issue, cartel conduct, uh, mentioned bid rigging, mentioned uh, the law, mentioned arrangement, agreement, you know, yes. Between competitors, yes. Outcome prohibited, yes. Now, in a written answer, you will need to provide a little bit more detail and what I have on the screen, but not much more will get you full marks. And so this is the key point. You would want to specify if, if the study guide has law or legislation, you need to write it down. Otherwise, you need to describe what the law is. You need to apply the tests and then you need to come to a conclusion. And the key points here are given to you in the case facts. So the next thing, exclusive deal. And after that, RPM, vertical price controls. 
So vertical, that's because it goes from the wholesaler down the chain, so downwards rather than horizontal with competitors, to the retailer. And they're trying to set a minimum price or resale price maintenance. And this was the second question that was set. So if you haven't done this already, just have a quick scan of the question. So if you get given a practice, or well, a practice exam, if you get given a CPA exam question, it won't be this short. It'll be two or three pages long, and you will have to, to read that. And then you will need to work through the steps, because if you just write an answer, like let's say you said this is illegal because it's resale price maintenance, you will get some marks because it's the correct conclusion, but you won't get all the marks because you haven't gone through the steps. So the first thing we need to look at is what's taken place. And in this case, it's resale price maintenance. The penalty was $2.2 million. And the tests that exist, uh, there's two main questions that we have to ask. Has the whole, like, wholesaler specified a minimum price to the retailer? You can specify a maximum price because that's good for consumers. But a minimum price is not good for consumers because it keeps the price higher artificially than it really should. Yeah, and as uh, Joanne has posted, has the supplier specified a minimum price and has action been taken to enforce this? So this is how we can address this question. So using the IRAC approach, we would say, has there been RPM? Has there been resale price maintenance? What is the relevant law? Now you'd have to go to the study guide and say, resale price maintenance is prohibited because it's anti-competitive. And this is where you know there's a supplier forcing the retailer to not sell below a minimum price. So let's apply this to the case facts. We've got two tests. Has there been a minimum price specified? And it says here, they've attempted to induce Mannix not to sell. So that looks like there is a minimum price specified. And did they take action? It's one thing to specify a minimum price or a recommended price, <coughs> but it's not the same as enforcing it. So the second question is, did they take action to force this to happen? And they did. They reduced discounts and they terminated dealer status. So they punished this person for not doing something illegal. So you can see why the penalty was like $2.2 million. And then we get to a conclusion. So can you see how I've done issue, law, apply, conclude? Once again, you would need to write a little bit more than this, but not pages and pages to come to the correct answer. So uh, someone's just asked, when they quote an RRP, is this a maximum price? It, RRP is, is, is not really either. It can be a maximum and it can be a minimum, but it's only a minimum if you try and stop someone selling below the RRP. So uh, what is the specific law we need to quote? So if you go through your module four study guide, what you'll notice is sometimes it mentions the law, like uh, abuse of market power, section 46. But then for something like cartel conduct, it might not mention the exact sections each time. So sometimes it just quotes the concept of the law that says resale price maintenance, where a minimum price is specified and action is taken, is prohibited. And if that's the case, that's all you need to state. So you only need to list the sections if it's given to you in the study guide. All right, any further questions on, on that uh, topic before I move on? All good. So what about taxis? So if it's a civil case, yeah, proof on the balance of prob probabilities. Uh, so when you say you don't get taxes or you don't get the resale price maintenance. Cool. I'll go back over it in the, uh, at the end of the webinar. So I'll keep on going. But, but the key is you can't force 
because, because if you're a wholesaler and you want to keep your, your prices nice and high, then that can be a problem. Yeah, cart, so cartel conduct usually has criminal abilities, that's correct. So not, not all of these areas have uh, criminal penalties attached. So I've just had a quick look in the study guide for resale price maintenance. It doesn't really tell you the, the, the section of law, but it just tells you the two tests of law. So that's what you would be required to show. Now, taxis do have price fixing, and that's a good thing. So it's kind of weird, but this is how you understand the law. The law is designed to protect consumers. So most of the time, fixing the price is bad because it fixes it too high, and then consumers have to give out more money than they should. But sometimes not having a fixed price leads to consumers being ripped off or tricked. So if a, if a tourist turns up and gets in a taxi, and the taxi driver says that's $150, that's a problem. Tourists will be looked off. They don't know what the fair price is. So having fixed prices that are stated and enforced actually creates a fair experience for the, the uh, cost customer or consumer in certain situations. So the law isn't just a blanket prohibition on price fixing. It looks at specific situations where it might actually help the consumer and it will allow exceptions or exemptions. And franchises and taxis are examples where this might occur. So what we now move on to, so we've looked at the anti-competitive types of situations. Now we have to look at consumer protections. And I talked about this uh, in wind school, so I'm not sure if you can remember the links here, but the key situation goes, the, the original consumer protection law goes back well over 100 years to the United Kingdom. And coffee was very, profitable, very expensive, very lucrative and full of prestige. And so what people used to do, unscrupulous retailers, would they would make up their own coffee because coffee was expensive. So it was easy to sell something that looked like coffee at coffee prices. And uh, they used to grind up horse manure, uh, chicory, bark, cinnamon, whatever they could find chicory and grind it all up, make sure it looked the right colour and then they would sell that as coffee. Now, in the old days, caveat emptor, buyer beware, tough luck to the consumer. But over time, people would get poisoned, sick, ripped off, and that was seen to be inappropriate. Quite disgusting, isn't it? So every time you have a nice cup of coffee, think about all the laws in place that make sure that what you're getting isn't going to kill you and isn't ripping you off. Because that's what companies will do to make a profit. They will mislead and deceive you. <coughs> Excuse me. So where are the key areas they do this? One of the key areas is in weight loss because people want to look good, so body image. They promise you these amazing either weight loss pills or weight loss equipment that magically solves all your problems without any hard work. Most of them are, are dodgy and misleading and deceptive, so action can be taken. And another example is eggs. So here's a quick question for you. See if you can read this. And as you read this, here are the questions. See if you can write these down on a sheet of paper prior to typing them all out, because that'll prompt others to, to see if they can figure it out too. But thank you, Jack. That was a very quick response. You you ahead of the curve. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this question in a minute, but the key is the company labelled free range eggs. The company got in a lot of trouble. What law did they break? So it's like a back to front question. I told you there's a breach. You have to tell me what the breach was and what rules apply. Let's have a look at this uh, law in a little bit more detail first. Another quiz question for you. This is something customers, will, uh, companies will do. They offered everyone a 20% off because, you know, if I tell you 20% off, you're very excited, aren't you? 
But the simple way to get around 20% off is to quickly put the prices up 20% or 10% or whatever it is, and then claim you're giving everyone a 20% discount. Very sneaky, makes people feel like they're winning, but it's actually misleading and deceptive. So which law has been broken? A few A's, a few B's. And this is one of the things you'll be need to be prepared for in your exam. Sometimes all of the options can be accurate and all of these laws are genuine. Nothing's made up here. But you have to know which one is relevant to the particular situation. So in this case, it's Section 18 of the Consumer Law. And the reason why is this is the old version of the law, but since this happened, uh, that that was replaced quite a few years ago. So this is the newer version. And these are from other countries. So A is Malaysia, someone's figured that out. But what we found is this happened in Australia. So even though this law is valid, it's in the wrong jurisdiction, it's in the wrong country. So what is puffery? Puffery is subjective and obvious exaggeration. So when you do marketing, you're allowed to talk about, we have the greatest product in the world. This is going to transform your life. If it's obvious and if it's subjective, which means you can't clearly and easily evaluate it against specific criteria, then that kind of advertising is like a puff of, of hot air, you know, hot air balloon. It's, it's puffery and it's permitted. But if it's objective, then that is not permitted. So here's a bit of a framework or a flow chart for the law. In Australia, Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law 2010. So if you get a question on misleading and deceptive conduct, then this is your issue and this is your law. So if the company was based in Hong Kong, use the Section 7. If it's Malaysia, someone picked that up before. If it's Japan, we have the Consumer Protection Basic Act. Now, prohibited misleading and deceptive in the way you do business, in the way you do advertising, it's not enough to tell the truth. You have to create a truthful impression in the mind of the person. So you can't carefully say the words in such a way that it tricks them. Honesty by itself is not enough. Truthful impression is what is required. And the great example there is the fire extinguisher case, where a company claimed when they sold their fire extinguishers that they had been tested for uh, their, their capability. And that was true, they had been tested, but they failed the test. So they only shared half the information that it had been tested, but they didn't create a truthful impression because by saying they'd been tested, they suggested that it was okay, that it was valid, that it was working. So what are our questions we have to ask? So when we get to the application phase, we ask, what is the impact on less informed people? Not a reasonable person test, but a less informed person test. Is it fair or deceitful? And this is where puffery is okay as long as it's obvious subjective exaggeration. And then there's a couple of cases here, the Hornsby case and the Apple case. I think the Hornsby case is when they got someone who had the same name as a famous person and said they would be coming to town, but it was actually someone else. So you can see you can mislead people even though you tell the truth. So this, you would include all this information as relevant when answering a question. Let's have a look at the egg case again. So what law did the company break? And Jack's already answered this, Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law. Is it puffery? And the answer is no. They put a label on their eggs called free range eggs. Now this can be evaluated and tested objectively. Free range is free ranging around in you know paddocks and fields, but they were kept in barns and never let outside. So that is not free. It's quite obvious that that wasn't the case. So they have tried to do something, yet look, it mentions section 19 in the study guide, uh, but that's actually an error. It should be section 18. Uh, we, we notified CPA of that about, I don't know, three years ago, and they just haven't bothered updating it yet. But yeah, section 18. So free range eggs, is clear in what that means in the mind of the consumer. So it's not puffery. Does caveat emptor apply the idea of buyer beware? No, 
In the past, in history, the buyer drinking their coffee with the horse manure in it, yeah, they had to beware. But we've decided that is no longer acceptable. Companies are not allowed to mislead and deceive consumers. So this is not acceptable. It's a prohibition now on misleading and deceptive conduct. That's correct. That's been uh, that's been prohibited. It doesn't exist in this situation. So you cannot say, oh, well, I put free range eggs on it, but it's up to the buyer to figure that out themselves. They should have come to our farm and had a look and then made their buying decision. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm not sure on the Apple case because sometimes in the Australian consumer law there are a range of different sections, but um, I, I can check that out later. But the key one, look, in any exam, if you use section 19 or 18, CPA markers know that they have to accept both of those because if it's in the study guide, then it has to be treated as correct. And you can do the same with section 33. That, that might be a specific area of law that was applied in that case. So we look at consumer protection, such as avoiding misleading deceptive conduct. Now we have another type of consumer protection, and it's AMI. And I won't, uh, but once again, what I'm showing you is how you can be easily given law based questions in a range of different areas. So the advertisements on radio were talking about men's health. And they were scaring men and saying, if you don't do this, this will be terrible. Your life will be not satisfactory and life is terrible. So come and pay us lots and lots and lots of money. And they were very successful at getting a lot of money out of people. They, the, if you listen to the, they have the telephone transcripts of these people piling the pressure on people, forcing them to sign up and hand over thousands of dollars of money. So what is going on here? What we have is harsh and unfair contracts being put in place that take advantage of someone in terms of, say, a special disability that they might have. So, and we call this unconscionable conduct. So yes, that's, that's correct. It's unconscionable because it, what unconscionable means totally unacceptable, totally inappropriate. Even if it's legal in that you've got a contract, you've signed it, they've signed it, this is totally inappropriate and the law can undo that contract. So the technique of frightening these men was uh, formulated by management and they had scripts, they had training sessions and they just took advantage of people. So they had action taken against them and they were found guilty. So the two key components you must describe if you're writing about unconscionable conduct is this idea of harsh and unfair so is there a contract where one party gets all of the rewards and the other gets none? So you remember your ethics in module two, justice theory. Is there a fair distribution of the benefits and the burdens? And what we have is this is not an appropriate situation because you have taken advantage of, of someone's sort of fear of a medical issue, whatever it might be, and manipulated that. Other examples of unconscionable conduct are a bank getting a couple of parents to guarantee their child's loan, but the parents were from another country who didn't understand English and didn't get any legal advice. Uh, the banks selling people foreign currency loans without explaining the risks that they could lose all their money. The, um, uh, someone who sold, got someone to sell their real estate while they were drunk and um, for an extremely low price, that was unconscionable. It was, oh, yeah, the Amadio case, well spotted harsh and unfair. Sometimes the telephone, telecommunications providers, the contracts they have with children with their mobile phones, totally unfair. All of a sudden you get like a $2,500 bill because they haven't been very clear about the data usage, harsh and unfair. And if you're a young person, 14 years old, you've got a, a, what we call a disability in this case of age. You don't have enough age and wisdom. So one party took advantage of that from another party. So how do we address this? We talk about the issue. Has there been unconscionable conduct? We look at the steps in the test. We say, is it harsh? Is it unfair? Have they taken advantage of a special disability? And then we look through other factors that are listed in the study guide. And then we talk through, this is likely to be a breach or not. Yeah, so the signing of the guarantors is unenforceable. If 
if there hasn't been legal advice obtained in those types of situations. So the banks are much stricter now at forcing you to go and get legal advice to make sure what you're doing is known and prepared. So we conclude with markets. How do we protect the market? So first of all, we looked at how do we protect uh, us from competitors abusing each other, then consumer protection, the customer, and now how do we protect the financial markets? And that's objective number six. So a key piece of law here is insider trading. There's a detailed clip on this, so I don't want to spend much time here. And we did this in winter school. You don't need to know the legislation. I don't think 1042A is mentioned, but inside information is defined as information that's not generally available. So it's inside, it's private, and it's important. It will have a material impact on the price. Now, if you possess that information and you know it's inside information, maybe because you sit on the board of directors or you've heard it from uh, during special negotiations, then you must not use this information and you cannot act on it to buy shares or sell shares and you cannot give it to someone else who might act on it or sell it. So if you have inside information and you use it, you've broken the law. That's right, caveat emptor means buyer beware. Uh, what is the law for unconscionable conduct? Uh, it's prohibited. So the I don't think the study guide has the legislation anymore in place, although it does in, um, I'll just see. So if you look at page 327 of the PDF, it talks about some case law, 1983, it's the Amadio case in the Commonwealth Bank. has. So that's an example where they haven't given you legislation but the law, and then there's a whole lot of dot points on, I'm looking on page 328, that tells you the tests for unconscionable conduct. So you would state those tests, apply them to the case facts and come to a conclusion. So with insider trading, a key one uh, recently was the, the jailing of, of this pair of people who worked together to make a $7 million profit. Well, one of them made millions and one of them only made like 20,000. So it wasn't very good for the friendship. So if we have an issue, we say, has insider trading occurred? What is the relevant law? So I, I showed you the relevant law on the PowerPoint slide, and then we go through the tests or the application. Is it information? Is it publicly available? Is it price sensitive? So in this case, we say, the ABS data, so the Australian Bureau of Statistics releases data, and that determines whether the economy is going up or down. And so it's important information because it will lead the foreign, foreign exchange rates to move, it can lead interest rates to move, it can lead share prices to go up or down. So someone working at the ABS will know that they have what would they call embargoed information, they have private or inside information. It is not generally available and it's certainly affects the financial markets. So this part is satisfied. Then the person working at the ABS knows that it's inside information. And what did they do? This person took it and shared it with their friend who then acted on it to make profits. So we say, here's our questions. Is it inside information? Yes. Is it publicly available? No. Is it price sensitive? Yes. So it meets the definition. Has someone personally acted on it or tipped someone else? Definitely. So as we work through each of these checks or tests, we can then come to a conclusion and say, because all of these steps have been made, there is inside information about the ABS. Someone possessed that, and then they use that information to gain advantage. Therefore, there is a breach of the insider trading law. So you can see how it's systematic, step by step by step. And if you know the law, the case facts are normally clear enough for you to come to a, a clear conclusion one way or the other. So market manipulation is the, the final part of module four. And it looks at things like press releases and rumors. So how do we push the share price up by sneaking and tricking? And once again, there's a detailed clip on this. It goes for about seven minutes. So I'll only be very brief here. Three examples are churning, pools and runs. So a churning is when you buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell to create the sense of activity that makes someone go, oh, something's going on there. I need to investigate further. A pool is when you pool your resources together and then you buy those shares and push the shares up. 
and it's a specific example of a run. A run is where you make you want to get the shares to run up or run down or something to happen. And if you get a group of participants who all do something, it, it's like if, if you all stand on a street corner, you and a few friends, and then you look up at one spot, everyone else on the street corner will also turn to look. So you can trick people into thinking, this is an important share, I need to get onto this, and everyone else buys in. The share price goes up and up and up, and then when it gets nice and high, you jump out, and then you make all your profits before the share price collapses. So the key point here is a run, and, and this is like the Venn diagram again, runs describe a whole, a whole lot of situations where people group together to move the market. And then a pool is a specific example of a run where you buy the shares to push the price up. So they are kind of like this, more intertwined. And if you see the, the short clip that we've put together in, in module four, on this, it, it explains it in a bit more detail. So you've got your churning, you've got your pools, you've got your runs. So easy questions to get a multiple choice question. The end of module four looks at road trading. And this is where people within a business speculate using using the business's money. They gamble. It's, it's effectively gambling on things like interest rates or foreign exchange rates to try and make a significant amount of money. Ponzi schemes are are situations, and you might have heard of pyramid selling before, where one person then sells or convinces two others to join, and then the money from that, they go and convince three others to join, who then go and convince more and more people to sign up. And as they sign up, the person at the top gets a huge amount of money, but the people at the bottom miss out. Why we call them Ponzi schemes? Well, they've been around a long time, but Ponzi was one of the best. He became a millionaire in under six months. And this is absolutely crazy. Imagine being offered a 100% return for three months investment. You give me $10,000 and in three months, I will give you your 10,000 back and a $10,000 profit on top. So everyone thought this is amazing and 40,000 investors signed up and gave him money. And the way you, you do this, to, because some people are suspicious, so this, the, you only get 10 or 20 people to start with. And what you do is you take their money and see how it promises a 50% return? Well, at the end of 45 days, you just give them half their money back and you say, here's your 50% return, see how good I am? And those people get so excited, they tell everyone else. And then the money piles in and then the whole thing collapses and the leader takes the cash. The, uh, the Madoff famous Ponzi scheme, these happen all the time uh, because people want to get rich quickly and they don't believe in hard work. But the reality in Australia now is if you put your money in the bank, yeah, pyramid scam, Ponzi scheme, very similar concept. You, uh, you get 3% return per annum if you put your money in the bank. So when I said things are too good to be true, then they're too good to be true. That's exactly the case going on here. If someone promises you in a crazy return, so we have friends of ours, um, their, their, their parents, they they invested down in Geelong. There was a company offering between 25 and 70% returns, Chartwell, and they promised this great returns and they just stripped the lot. People lost their life savings, they lost their superannuation because it looked so fantastic that people signed up and went for it which is just uh, absolutely awful. Uh, I'll, so the last thing on for tonight is the phoenix. The phoenix describes, if, if you've watched Harry Potter, you'll know all about this. The phoenix is the bird that dies and then burns up and then rises, is reborn from the ashes. And companies can do the same thing. So a company can rise and trade and then it can die. And it might die owing lots of money to the tax office to its employees and to its suppliers. So they die, say it's owing $5 million. But what's interesting is the next day it comes back alive and keeps on trading, but it hasn't paid any of those 5 million in debts and it starts the process again. So a construction company, for example, brings in all this revenue, but doesn't pay any of its expenses. It just, and then repeats the process. This is very dishonest. You've got these directors who keep doing this over and over again, failing to pay the tax office, 
suppliers, employees, and it's it's horrific how they do it. So uh, there's laws trying to capture these phoenixes, but it's very hard to catch them and stop them from doing this process. All right. So uh, next week we'll be talking about module five. As I said earlier, if you need to email me or ask questions about the practice exam, please have a look at uh, eg at knowledgeequity.com.au. Next week, we'll be looking at the uh, module five, first practice exam. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about this after the webinar. First practice exam is available on Friday. And then there's a couple of rules for, for getting access to that. So uh, let me talk about that now. For those of you who've, who've done the practice exams or know how it works, great, you can sign off now. Uh, otherwise, just hang around for a couple of minutes and I'll explain it in a bit more detail. So to access the practice exam, by the 28th of September, you need to have uploaded your CPA enrolment. So you'll go into the main course and you go to book your practice exams. So upload your enrolment, schedule your practice exam. Then what we've got is on Friday, you'll see a new course appear in your system. So at the moment you have this main course, you'll get a new one called practice exams. You just click on that, click start course when you're ready to do it. When you make your booking, here's the timetable. And remember it takes four business days to mark your paper. So if you sit your practice exam on a Wednesday, for example, it tells you when you get those back. Sorry, that table doesn't line up too nicely. Uh, where can you find the ENG index? In the main course. If you go into our main course, there's an example of how to do an ENG index. You can sit the practice exam at any time of day. You get one attempt. Can you reschedule? Yes, you can. You just change your exam book and go in and click on that orange button and book it again. Can you print it out? No. And Sometimes people try and print it out and take it into their exam. Our questions will not be the same as the CPA exam. So it's it's a bit self-defeating. I think you'll, you'll be just creating extra work. What's the deadline for scheduling? There's no deadline, but if you haven't uh, uploaded your enrollment by Friday or Thursday night, um, you won't get full access. We have several thousand students do the practice exams and hardly any trouble, but we do. some people do hit trouble and sometimes it's self-inflicted. So I'm going to tell you these things, so please avoid these problems. What, what tends to happen? The number one reason people have problems is they use Safari. And we say, please use Chrome, and then they ring up and say, I lost all my answers, and I was using Safari, and I know you said use Chrome, but I didn't. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Sam. Yeah, I nearly get my voice back soon. If you use Safari and something goes wrong, uh, my apologies, but our system doesn't work with Safari. So please don't, and that will solve that problem, and then you won't have an issue. Uh, your exam finishes after one question. Sometimes people click Submit Quiz. Now, there's even a pop-up saying, are you sure about this? So don't click Submit Quiz until you get to the end. Click on Next Question. All right. Uh, Internet Explorer work for the midterm access? That, that's fine. It can work. Safari can work, but there's situations where it doesn't. And like I said, when you have several thousand people do it, if 50 people use Safari, 10 will lose all their work and they'll get upset. So we say use Chrome. Um, we can't force you, but that's how it works. Another thing with Safari is even if it keeps your answers, the, the timer clock doesn't work at the same speed. So you think you've got 20 minutes left and then the exam finishes and you get really angry and upset. But the reality is Safari doesn't work with the timer. So you need to use Chrome. And uh, Make sure you use Ethernet, um, not Wi-Fi. If something goes wrong, that will help. If you want to do it, uh, if you did it on Sunday, scheduled Sunday, you want to do it Saturday, that's perfectly fine. Just do it on the Saturday. We have a whole bunch of instructions and information. Read that carefully. Uh, and then just as it says, please don't use Safari. But it's amazing the number of people who email us and say, I was using Safari. I just ignored that thing because I didn't think it was all that important. And now I've lost three and a quarter hours of work. What can you do? And the answer is we can't do anything. Um, so please trust us on this one. Uh, there's information about uploading written responses and marking your papers. And the other thing we do is a thing called a system test. We get you to do a system test to make sure you're using Chrome and that you can download the Word document and upload it without any stress 
or problems. So we'll give you all of that um, information and that's fine. Yep, if you've booked on the um, the first, if you've done the on the 4th and the 9th, that'll work perfectly. You'll have those marked and returned to you on time. The other thing is you get one attempt. So we get people go, I clicked on it just to have a look, but I want to do it later. And the answer is it only works once. So there's not much else you can do. Yep, so you, you save the Word document to your desktop. And then when you typed in the answers, there's an upload option. You, you upload the file, you attach it, it sends it to me and it sends it to you as an email. So if you don't get it as the email, then you know it didn't work and uh, that works that works perfectly. Uh, and that's about it. It's going to look, this is what it'll look like, just like a module quiz, just like a mid-semester test. Uh, there's a start quiz option, off we go. I always ask people to use the I don't know instead of randomly guessing. If you randomly guess and you get the answer right, that can lead to trouble because you think you know something but you actually don't. How many questions? 60 multiple choice and then written answer worth 25 marks. If your internet drops out, there's not much we can do. It'll just finish your exam at that point. So make sure you're somewhere that has really good ADSL or internet connection. The other thing we're doing, check your emails, we're doing this thing called boot camp. Boot camps for people who've actually just signed up, fallen behind, and all it is is a, a quick encouragement webinar. It's on this Wednesday at 8.30, and then you get a 10-day study plan where you do one webinar a day, a couple of videos and some questions to get yourself back on track. No, the first one, you are examined for modules one to five. So you have to complete all of the units in modules one to four, but the exam is just like a CPA exam, modules one to five, 85 marks, 60 multiple choice questions, 25 marks of it's an answer. Um, <coughs> someone's, so I've seen a few questions. Uh, can you send me some law based questions to check and provide feedback? Before you do that, just do the practice exams because the law based questions are there and I will mark them and give you feedback. And there's a detailed solution on how to write your answer as well. So that's the, the best step. Otherwise, I'll get overwhelmed. My marking starts this Friday and uh, I've got, yeah, there'll be several thousand papers to mark. So I'm going to be pretty flat out. Um, so if you wait for that, that would be great. What is, someone asked, what is the difference? Or please explain staggering and de-staggering. So staggering works like this. Everyone on the board is, if you de-stagger, everyone gets tipped off at once. So staggering is when, let's say, three board directors go off one year and then three the following year and then three the following year. Because if you do that, let's say you have nine directors and three leave the board every year. Well, then you still have six directors carrying on the memory the history of that board. And then the following year, another three disappear. So you still have six people with experience. And then the following year of your nine directors, another three. So they it de-staggers in time. This one, then this one, then this one goes. Yeah, so with boot camp, you will just be emailed the uh, the link to come along to the webinar at 8.30 p.m. An example of puffery. Please come and buy my wine. It is the most beautiful and greatest tasting wine in the history of the whole world. So it, beautiful, greatest, best in the world are all obvious subjective exaggerations. There's no way of proving that. Um, so anytime you, you you go crazy excited but fluffy, that's puffery. Uh, for case study question answers, how many words should we use roughly? The, the best situation there is to do your practice exam and see how it goes. You often don't have to write very much. You just have to go through the like the IRAC or the seven steps of ethics or whatever it is. But normally two or three paragraphs is adequate. So yep, 60 MCQs, 25 marks of written answer is how it um, goes together. Boot camp's about 30 minute webinar, 40 minute webinar, and then a 10 day study plan. If you've been coming to all the webinars, if you've been to winter school, there's not much point coming. Uh, but if you think it'll be helpful to get you back on track, that's great too. All right. Uh, if you booked your practice exam on the 4th and the 9th, and you're in, is that too late? No, that's that's actually really good. So if you have a look at the timings that we suggested for your practice exams, let, we'll use that as an example. So your, your exam is on the 23rd of October, Monday the 23rd. 
So we recommend doing exam one on the 8th and exam two on the 15th. And you've picked, uh, you picked the 4th and the 9th. So you're actually going a little bit earlier. That's fine. So if you want to delay a couple of days, that's fine. But what you've chosen is, is fine. So someone's picked the 17th. So if your CPA exam is on the 17th, fine, you should do your first paper next Monday, 2nd of October, and the second one the following Monday. That's the, the best time to, we think, get the right amount of feedback and experience. But you could do them on the Sunday night instead of the Monday. It depends on your, your work and items like that. If I've missed your question, my apologies, because they've all, I think I've um, answered everything. But if I haven't, please email me or please post again. Otherwise, we'll, we'll finish up. 